On October 11th of 2018, a Soyuz rocket was scheduled to send a crewed mission to the International Space Station. However, just a couple minutes after launch, the rocket experienced some issues and therefore the crewed capsule had to be jettisoned and safely landed a few hundred kilometers away. But what happened to the vehicle? What did the crew experience during this emergency jettison? And what does this mean for the future missions to the International Space Station? Let's talk about that. Before we discuss the anomaly that took place, let's first familiarize ourselves with the Soyuz rocket. The Soyuz is used by the Russian space agency Oros Cosmos and is dated all the way back to 1966, with the first crewed launch being in 1967. Though the name is somewhat confusing because the Soyuz represents both the rocket and the capsule that's on top of the rocket that holds the crew. Now, the Soyuz rocket has made a major impact in space exploration over the last few decades, not only because of its high success rate, but also because right now it's the only rocket capable of sending astronauts or cosmonauts to the International Space Station. And according to the European Space Agency, as of a few years ago, the Soyuz rocket had launched upwards of 1,700 missions to space, which is pretty impressive. Now since 1966, there have been many different iterations of the Soyuz rocket and Soyuz capsule. More specifically, the Soyuz rocket currently is 49.5 meters tall, is capable of taking around 7,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. In addition, this iteration of the Soyuz has launched 55 times, with this one being the first failure. Now what took place on October 11th? The crew consisted of Oleski Oshinin, that was the commander of the mission, and Nick Haig, who was the flight engineer. This would be Oleski's second mission to the International Space Station, and Nick's first. Now the day started out as any other launch day, everything was going according to plan, the launch took place, and up until two and a half minutes into flight, everything was going smoothly. However, this time the crew started reporting weightlessness. Now you may think them experiencing weightlessness is a good thing, however this was way too early in the flight, they were nowhere near achieving orbit. Then a few seconds later, flight control realized that one of the boosters had malfunctioned and therefore they needed to separate the crew capsule from the rocket. Now the abort sequence took place about 2 minutes and 45 seconds into the flight, which means they were at an altitude of around 50 kilometers. And in addition, they can't just stay in the same vicinity as the rocket if it happens to explode, therefore they have to push the themselves even higher and further from the rocket in the case that something bad was to happen to the main launch vehicle. Therefore what ended up happening is they reached an altitude of 80 kilometers and had to come basically straight back down in a ballistic trajectory. Now the capsule continued down through the atmosphere using its re-entry shield and parachutes to safely land it on the surface 400 kilometers away from the launch pad, which was incredible that they could be able to recover from this malfunction on the rocket. Now the picture that you see right now was actually taken by an astronaut on the ISS and you can actually see the emergency separation where the rocket was ascending and the crew capsule at the very peak. Now there are a lot of design features that go into the development of these crew capsules to make sure that the crew is as safe as possible. This means detecting some variations with the rockets and seeing how well it's performing. If it's not, not meeting the expectations then they can either manually or automatically abort the system. And in doing so, as I mentioned before, it has to push them away as fast as possible. Now with that being said, the astronauts and cosmonauts still have to go through a lot of training to be able to prepare for such a re-entry. Typically, they only experience around 3 G's when they're launched, and that's about the maximum throughout their entire flight. However, when they have this type of ballistic trajectory, they can experience upwards of 6 to 7 G's. Now what does that mean? For example, if you're on Earth, we are all experiencing 1 G that's pulling us down to the surface, which is equivalent to 9.8 meters per second squared. Now this acceleration explains why if you drop two different objects with two different weights or masses from the same height, then they'll hit the ground with the same speed if you don't consider air resistance. Now a single G is what we experience here on the surface every day through our normal routine. However, when the crew capsule re-entered ballistically, you have to multiply that by six or seven times. Now to put that into perspective, the average unaided human can only experience around nine Gs before the blood in their vessels has a hard time getting to their brain and causes them to black out. For example, roller coasters usually get upwards of around three Gs of acceleration. And if we put this into perspective with the average person, although they can withstand up to nine Gs, usually they start to go unconscious after only four to six which means that if you put an average person in this scenario in the crew capsule the likelihood that they would pass out is pretty high 
But astronauts and cosmonauts are really well trained in this sort of situation. In fact, one of the first thing you might think of when I say astronaut training is someone sitting in this giant machine that spins around really fast. Yep, that's G-force training. It's actually called a centrifuge though. So even though they're only expected to experience around three Gs during the typical launch, they prepare for the worst case scenario, going six or even higher Gs for what could possibly go wrong. Or in this case, they were prepared for what was going to happen. But just training isn't the only thing that they do to help assist astronauts. There are actually suits called G-suits that are used for astronauts, cosmonauts, and even fighter pilots. And this allows them to put pressure on their legs to keep the blood flowing when they get to these high G environments. Now the Roscosmos went back to look at what could have happened to make this vehicle malfunction. And in fact, they realized that the first stage has interfered with the second stage during separation, which caused it to malfunction. Now we have seen something like this before with SpaceX's Falcon 1 and its attempts to get to orbit. Now during separation, the inner stage actually collided with the nozzle causing it to malfunction. But in this case, the Soyuz has four boosters on the side of its second stage and when those released, they contacted with the second stage causing it to malfunction. So now that we really understand what happened on October 11th, let's discuss what this means for future missions to the International Space Station. Now the first thing we need to realize is the Soyuz rocket is the only launch vehicle capable of taking crew to the International Space Station as of right now. Now with that being said, the Russian space agency or Roscosmos is going to have to look at the vehicle and make sure everything is safe for their next crewed launch attempt because they don't want to risk anyone's lives trying to get there. In addition, this raises the question of what about the astronauts that are already on the International Space Station? And they're not stranded. They have a Soyuz capsule there that they can return. However, the Soyuz capsule has an expiration date in space. It can only last for 200 days in the vacuum of space, meaning that by January of 2019, those three astronauts have to return back on that Soyuz capsule, meaning that the International Space Station, for the first time since 2000, will be empty. Now, the one way to avoid this is if Roscosmos does figure out how to fix this malfunction and is able to send another mission up in time or just another empty crewed capsule that could then be used in a later date to then reset that 200 day expiration date. Now the International Space Station costs around a hundred billion dollars and in January we might be leaving it, but not for long. NASA has come forward and said that they would probably be able to maintain it for a few months from mission control or maybe even longer, but they haven't come forward and said exactly how long. But that does give Roscosmos a little bit more time to understand what the issue is and make the vehicle more safer for the next flight. In addition, it's thought that this could put a lot more pressure on the two commercial companies that are trying to send missions to the International Space Station. These companies being SpaceX and Boeing. If you're familiar with the commercial spaceflight industry, you probably have been keeping up that SpaceX and Boeing are trying to be the first commercial companies to send crew to the International Space Station. This predicted to happen in mid to late of 2019. However, if there isn't any crew on board the International Space Station, that raises a lot more safety concerns for whether or not Boeing or SpaceX can actually dock and perform everything they need to without anyone on the other end of the station. So even though it's not guaranteed that the International Space Station will be empty, it raises a lot of questions, well, if it is empty, what does it mean for the future of the space station as a whole? And that's where I want to end it. What do you think? Do you think that the Soyuz will be up and running in time to be able to keep the space station crewed? Or do you think that this could put a lot of pressure on the commercial spaceflight companies and their endeavors to get to the ISS? Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.